welcome you to the media ministries of the Gathering Church in the Countryside YMCA of Mainville. As we love the Lord and each other, we're trusting that God would use us to plant a church in every YMCA around the world. To this end, would you join us? We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. and in community groups throughout the week. As you listen to this resource, our prayer is that your love for Jesus would grow deep and your love for others would be seen and heard. Let's pray together as a church. Lord, those songs were just the songs that we needed to hear, that we needed to sing and declare and be reminded Uh, by your spirit uh, that you are good that you are gracious you are king you reign over all you're holy far separated and otherworldly than anything of this world yet so good and gracious to send your son Jesus to pay for our sins to um, satisfy your wrath and to walk with us so that we are not alone. And so we delight in you this morning, and we're grateful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, the gathering lights, kids seven on down, can be dismissed. Some to the back, fellowship hall, some downstairs. But uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And hey, if you're a guest here, we just want to welcome you this morning. Uh, My name is Mike Newman. I'm the pastor here, and uh, and I have been so for the last three years. And so I'd just like to say happy anniversary today. Yes. Today, uh, to God be the glory, uh, we we turned three years old as a church. Isn't that fun? That's, there's just much to celebrate. God is so good, and uh, he has just been so good and gracious uh, to us. Just even think back in the last three years in how the Lord has ministered to you uh, by his word uh, through other people uh, in this congregation, how you've grown in Christ, how you have uh, delighted more in the Lord. Uh, it's, just, it's just been a joy uh, to witness And then even just on behalf of me personally, one of my greatest delights, and I've said this before, is that um, a part of being a pastor, one of my greatest delights is being a sheep first. And uh, Jesus shepherding me. And I need him. And I need to sing those songs. And I'm I'm not above it. I'm I'm very much so underneath the hand of the good shepherd with you. And so um, what a joy. What a joy to journey with you guys. So, happy anniversary. Can I tell you the plan? Would that be all right? The plan for the next two weeks. Next week. Next week we are going to be in the book of Romans, chapter 13. You didn't know there was other chapters after chapter 12, did you? Many of you love chapter 12. It's like your favorite of all time. But newsflash, there are more chapters in the book of Romans and it gets really good still. It gets really good still. Next week, if you don't know or if you're not familiar with the book of Romans, chapter 13 deals with how the Christian relates to government. And I know that is totally unapplicable to these times. Maybe you're totally not interested in that kind of stuff. Just kidding. A little bit of dry humor there. But... Aren't you encouraged that the Bible speaks to everyday life? Like God wants to help you think rightly and act biblically in every circumstance. And he, through his word, speaks to how the Christian should relate and live under and according to and with and against and all of that. We're going to get into it, the government. So come back next week and we'll get after it. But this week we're doing something a little different and a little, um, a little special. This life, uh, this this Sunday, we're going to look um, at one man, at one man's life. Um, we're going to do a biography sermon this morning, okay, for our anniversary Sunday. So just breaking a little bit from Romans. Uh, I learned it from a guy named John Piper. Some of you might know that name. 
Um, when he was the pastor of Bethlehem Baptist for like 20, 25, whatever years, he chose to study one extra biblical character in history for a whole year and then uh, deliver it to his people in a biographical manner to say, hey, these are like great clouds of witnesses before us. Let's learn from great men and women of the faith. Um, There's a great quote that says that we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And so he would just, he would relay one person every year and, uh, and that's what I would like to do this morning. It's really good to study um, b- other believers um, in other time periods, in other cultures that have uh, struggles, that have challenges, and to see how they went through them and how they lived. And it is not meant to just be a history lesson so that you would know more about a certain person. Um, it's actually meant so that you would emulate their faith so that you would learn from them and imitate them that's from hebrews 13 17 which says remember those who led you who spoke the word of god to you and considering the result result of their conduct imitate their faith so today we are going to study the man named george williams Uh, who founded the Young Man's Christian Association, uh, the YMCA. So of course, on the anniversary Sunday of a church that is planted in the Y, uh, we're choosing this guy to remind us of our vision, uh, remind us um, uh, of of the genesis of the Y. Um, And if you're visiting here and like you're caught off guard, like, why am I hearing YMCA lingo from the preacher dude this morning? All I know about the YMCA is that song and the village people and things like that. <laughs> Side note, great song. Um, I hope that, that by the end of today, you'll be encouraged in your faith, that you'll be challenged, uh, that you'll be gripped with the love of God through Jesus Christ and how he worked in the life of a real person, George Williams, and how he lived his life for Christ and others. So hopefully it'll sharpen some of you. Hopefully if you don't know the Lord, it'll be a witness and a testimony like, ah, that's how you come to know the Lord and live for him. So that's my goal for you today, to imitate George Williams' faith. And on a personal note, as I've been just studying the life of this man this week, Um, I've been really challenged by his life and his faith. Um, As I've been studying it, fun fact, my main source um, has actually been the book that my brother David is writing. So he's been writing this book on George Williams um, to be released on George Williams' what would have been 200th birthday to the YMCA globally. And so we're still battling to raise the C in the YMCA so that the YMCA would be a platform to the community to reach people for Jesus. Um, And so this uh, book is well-written, gospel-saturated. It'll be released hopefully next month and um, will hopefully be in the hands of every CEO of the Y across the world and um, will continue to make Jesus famous. Amen? All right, so title of today, The Life of George Williams, and we're just going to go through four parts of his life, or four aspects. So number one, the beginnings. Uh, Number two, his surrendered life. Number three, his prayerful life. And number four, his outward life. The beginnings, surrendered, prayerful, and his outward life. So let's start with the beginnings. Biographical sermon on George Williams. Are you ready? Okay, let's go for it. On October 11th, 1821, Elizabeth Williams gave birth to her eighth and last son. Eight sons. I know. I'm the youngest of four. I can relate to what George must have felt like having seven older brothers. But uh, Mama, she was... Hoping for a girl that last time around, but they got a boy. Dad was just fine with it because they lived on a farm, and that just meant extra help uh, bailing and carting hay. Uh, George was 
uh, in the family really known for being the life of a party, surprise, surprise, being the youngest. He's pretty cheerful, lots of energy from this guy. And uh, he would often daydream uh, during uh, the work hours of the day. Uh, He would think about life, the purpose of life, and why am I here on this earth, and what is what, what, what's, what's the purpose of mankind and humanity? And he would think deeply and ask deep questions to his brothers and his parents. Um, George was known as a high-strung kind of a guy. And um, his daddy loved to just put him to work in the hay fields with all of his deep questions of life. <laughs> like, you know what, son? Just pay some hills, buddy, okay? And... Um, Surprise, surprise, this deep thinker wasn't the greatest at pushing the hay cart. So there was this this turning point um, in his life one day. It wasn't a result of him not being a hard worker that he wasn't good at it. He just had, he was a visionary. He had so much going on in his mind. It was tough for him to concentrate and get in that one wheel, in that rut, on those paths that have been there for hundreds of years so that the cart wouldn't tip over. So one day, he was pushing this hay cart, and lightning flashed, thunder rolled, like, you know, eat your heart out, Garth Brooks, right? And he's pushing this cart and starts hurrying um, because he doesn't want um, to push a, a, a cart full of wet hay. Starts hurrying, it tips over, hay goes everywhere, you know, he goes everywhere, He's laying down in the mud, looking up in the sky, and asks the question, is there more to life than just pushing a cart of hay? That's what he later recorded. There was kind of a picture of his life in that he seemed himself to be stuck in this rut. This like, this rut and everything was chaos and, and just just disorganized, and so he was himself at a tipping point. And so his family called him in. It was kind of this like family meeting, and uh, they decided, you know what, George? Maybe uh, pushing a hay cart isn't for you. Um, Maybe there's other things uh, in your life that that you're good at. And Dad had some buddies, and he decided uh, to call them up And the line goes, um, how about drapes, George? And so he called up Mr. Hitchcock, and uh, they sent this this, uh, young man to a drapery. Now, uh, in those days, uh, drapery meant textiles, all sorts of fabrics, not just curtains, how we would know it today. And so George exchanged his life on the farm uh, for life in the factory. And in the middle of the 19th century, um, this spent actually a very, very difficult life. Um, He joined 27 other young men that lived and worked in this factory every day, managed by a man named Mr. Holmes of Bridgewater. And um, in during that time, the environments, uh, the work environments in London, were horrible. They included young people um, that had excessive hours, little rest. Um, They breathed in an incredible amount of dirt. They had a lot of respiratory disease associated with breathing in uh, different fabric fibers. Uh, Children were recorded during that time to be unnaturally pale Um, with distorted postures from holding certain uh, postures for long periods of time. Uh, Some of them were recorded to miss various uh, fingers because of unsafe machinery, Uh, working long hours in dark, dreary, windowless rooms. Kids, how'd you like to work in one of those places, huh? Childhood innocence during this time was was lost with drunkenness, with rape, coldness, uh, alienation, and if you just wanted to paint a one big broad brushstroke, just the lack of love and care. And so the general demeanor of the workforce during this time was just no joy, 
And they were just desperate for hope. So George, 16 years old, one winter evening, uh, found himself with some of his factory buddies uh, at a, a, in the back row of a tiny chapel on Fairn Street in London. Uh, and they all came with questions and, and heart longings and maybe just a little bit of hope. Like maybe the church would be the place that offered a little bit of answers with regards to what we're looking for. Uh, the minister was named Reverend Evan James. It's said that he was not a remarkable pastor or a famous author. He wasn't known to be powerful in speech, eloquent in speech, or influential as a person. Um, in fact, what was recorded of him during this time, and catch this, that he was just a man of gentle spirit and a holy life whose grasp of principle was very firm. How'd you like that to be said of you? No one really remembers the exact sermon that was given that day that George was there, but George recalls that day a great heart transformation, a heart shift as a result of hearing God's word, the gospel being spoken to him this morning. It was like all sorts of light bulbs turned on and he began to understand something that he hadn't so before. So again, no one like knows the precise verse or, or the, the perfect quote or whatever that turned George's heart, but that's not the thing. I could imagine that it went something like this. Hey, welcome to church. Hey, it's my job to convey whatever is in this book this morning. And so I want to tell you that humanity is in a real troubled state. In fact, if you're a human <laughs> and sitting here today, that God is angry at you. And that his wrath, because he is holy, 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 is being poured out upon mankind but there is a way out of it. There is a way to dodge the wrath of God. There is a way to satisfy the wrath of God. And that's through belief in Jesus Christ. God, because he loves mankind so much, sent his son Jesus to pay for the penalty of our sin and satisfy his wrath towards us. The scripture says that even while we were yet sinning, Christ died for us. How about that love, people? But it's not enough to just know and understand it at a cognitive level that you must individually receive this gift. You must receive the gift of faith so that the wrath of God would be subverted and that you would know God personally. You can know Jesus personally, and it's through his son, Jesus. I would imagine that George heard something like that. And if that is your first time hearing that, or your hundredth time hearing that, and if you've never received Jesus, that means that you are not a Christian, and God's wrath is being poured out upon you, and one day you will receive it in full. And the way to know him intimately and to be in heaven is to receive Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And he will send his spirit to indwell you and he will be with you forever. That's what George did. After the service, George's friends, they, they told him how to have this new life that the preacher was talking about from his word. And they, they encouraged him. And I quote, confess your sins, accept Christ, trust him, and yield your heart to the Savior. So again, hey, do you know the Lord? Have you ever done this? You need to be told today that God wants to know his children. He loves you so much so that he sent his son and if you've ever thought this thought, ah, oh, he doesn't love me, 
I'm just a blank. I'm just a drapery worker. I just work in the factory. I just am a farmer. I'm just an IT. I just, I'm just the nobody. Why would? If those are your thoughts, be encouraged because God saved George Williams. A little boy from a farm who was working long hours in the drapery. He set his affections on him. The beginnings. There is something, though, about that quote that his friends told him to yield your heart to the Savior that George caught, not because he was extra smart, but because God changed his heart. George viewed his conversion as not just a one time surrender, but a whole life marked by surrendering to the Savior. So number two, let's study George and his surrendered life, okay? So on that snowy evening, when he came to know the Lord, the back of the chapel on Fairn Street, his heart changed. He wasn't just like, oh, that would be nice, I think I'll do that. But he yielded his heart to God. And he went back to the factory, factory, knelt on the floor, and he spoke to God. Later in his life, George described this moment, and he said, God helped me to yield myself wholly to him. I cannot describe to you the joy and the peace which flowed into my soul when I first saw that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins and that they were all, get this, all forgiven. Isn't that great? So this was the turning point in George's life where he encountered God and became right or got peace with God. His life wasn't perfect. It wasn't like trouble-free, but it is true, and we've said it already in this service, that he wasn't going to live alone anymore. That a relationship with Jesus replaced an empty religion. That joy and peace took the place of this longing or this searching that George had. So George, in summary, viewed his conversion as a calling on his life, not just a ticket to get out of hell for free. It wasn't just fire insurance. It was a a whole calling to surrender and yield to the Savior. So 150,000 young men had come to London, England during those years to seek work. It was more than that, though. They, they, they wanted to seek significance, a better life, purpose. They were longing for something more. And when they got their jobs and when they got to London and they were working for 16 hours in those tiny rooms with shared, sharing it with strangers and little time to eat or sleep, these young men quickly fell into depression and they, their pursuits of a, a better life were quickly met in their own hearts by just the, uh, an abrupt realization that this is how it's going to be. No hope. And George Williams looked around in this factory at his friends, at his fellow workers, at his generation, really, and he said, and I quote, I see no means of grace. What he saw was an emptiness, an aimlessness, a hurt, struggle. And he felt like what he was watching was this, what what was all these lights just flickering and dimming and going out and all these people. And he stood watching and he didn't know what to do. Um, I'm reminded of the passage that we studied together in First Chronicles. Remember the story of Jehoshaphat when he saw the armies coming and it's recorded, he didn't know what to do. And so he looked to the Lord and said, we don't know what to do, <laughs> but our eyes are on you. You remember that great verse? What an applicable verse for our time. And that's exactly what George Williams did. And he paused for a second 
He prayed and he looked to the Lord. Let's ourselves, though, just pause for a second because that is very Christianese, right? Like, he lived a surrendered life. So, church, yield to God, right? And we never um, press into that. We never yield or, or we never even lean into that idea of, of what it means to yield yourself to God. Yield, like we most often hear that word on the street, we see a yield sign. And so certainly when we see a yield sign, we wouldn't push on the gas and go faster, but we slow down, we pause, we look around. We go, oh, this is an area where we need to pursue a little bit more safety. And so when it comes to like surrendering, surrendering and yielding to God, he would have us slow down to look, to pause, to pray. And I think living the life of, of a surrendered life needs to, um, needs to be explained in more specificity. Because if we're not careful, all we'll receive from, hey, uh, the pastor guy said that I need to live a surrendered life. And so, if the Lord calls me to Australia, then I'll go. And it becomes this passive surrender that only relates to great things of magnitude, massive life decisions. If the Lord calls me to do that, then I'll go. Certainly it includes that, does it not? But a life of surrender calls the believer to so much more than that, to the unseen, mundane, every aspect of life surrender. So here's a couple examples. So let's say you're talking with someone and you're led by the Spirit to speak up. Whether it's a passage of Scripture or maybe it's a, a, a counsel that you know. Maybe it's an admonition or a correction like, oh no, this person is headed down the path of destruction. I need to say something. You're led by the Spirit to do that. But then your flesh starts working. Your mind starts thinking and you start reasoning in man's like way of thinking like this. Oh, if I say that, he won't like me anymore. <laughs> oh, if I say that, um, he, he might argue with me. If I say that, or if I share that verse, maybe they'll think I'm self-righteous. And you never felt like that before? Me too. But the surrendered heart would say, Lord, my life is yours. And I yield to you. Or what about this one? Uh, let's say you're with another person and, and you just are gripped. You're convinced that God wants you to pray with them. You know that God loves to use prayer. He wants to work in your life. He wants you to pray with other people. And so you start going, yes, Lord, I want to be used by God in the morning. And then like by the afternoon, you're like, oh, well, I'm going to like stick my neck out that far, right? I'm not going to pray for that person. And then you start thinking, right? And I can think these thoughts with you because I've experienced them too. You're out on the soccer field. Practice is done. Everyone's walking back. Kids are everywhere. And you go, maybe it's not the right time. I'm just, th there would be a better moment. They're in a hurry, probably. They're probably hungry and they need to get home. I don't want to delay them from, you see how the mind works? And so, us believers, we're called to surrender our thoughts, our heart, our desires to the Lord, to yield to them, to be used by God. That's the mark of a surrendered life, where you go, 
My, my life's his now. I'm meant to be used for his glory and not my own. One more example, okay? Let's say you get in an argument with your spouse. Totally hypothetical. I've talked to most of you this week, and I know that that never happens. Maybe like once a year, okay? Or let's say you get in the argument with your sibling, okay? Or with a coworker or a buddy or whatever, okay? I've got like all of your attention now. Like everyone perked up like, oh, 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 this this relates to me. Okay. And you are under the conviction of the Holy Spirit to go back to your spouse, buddy, sibling, coworker, whatever, and ask for forgiveness. You're like, I was wrong and I need to go back. And so you want to live a surrendered life under the Lord, but here's how you handle it. I think she'll forget about it. Time will heal, right? Or maybe I could just do something nice to compound and and put like a nice gloss over it. So I'll just like bring her a glass of lemonade or something, do the dishes, clean something, and it'll be fine, right? (laughs) Whoever laughed back there, you know. But you need to come and say, will you forgive me, right? That's a life of surrender. Back to George, his prayerful life. That was his surrendered life, his prayerful life. So if you're surrendered unto the Lord, this leads to a life of prayer. So prayer is a posture of surrender towards God. If you ain't praying, you're not surrendered. And prayer is is this crying out to God for God's direction, discernment. Like I remember when I was little and someone explained to me what prayer was, it was just talking with God. And I could feel, even this week, my soul getting dry. Anyone ever experienced that? And I was just evaluating, like, Lord, why am I feeling far from you? Why am I dry in my heart? Do I need to change my schedule? Like, should I cancel family time? Should I cancel soccer practice or volleyball practice? Should I take the day off? Should I do this? And it's, it wasn't an issue for me of like clearing out a schedule thing. It was me including the Lord in my schedule. Saying, Lord, I'm about to step out of the car. Would you help me here? Lord, I'm about to go to this meeting or I'm about to lead this practice or I'm about to dot, dot, dot. Would you help me? Here's what I'm thinking. I wasn't talking to him. (laughs) And God in his grace just brought me back to a place where I could just appreciate my relationship with the Lord again and talk to him. So George was working in the drapery factory and his heart, because he was a believer, because he had the spirit, began to swell with the love of God. Like God started changing his heart. And one of the first things like, that happens to a believer is they just get excited about the Lord. They want to know him more. They want to talk to him. They want to pray. And so one of the first things he did was he just gathered a bunch of his friends in the factory and said, hey, How about we just pray together? He didn't like have a cool degree. He didn't have the latest cool prayer book. He just wanted to pray. And so they started meeting in this dorm room that is infamously known now as room 14. Room 14 was a tiny room above the factory where all these young men slept and ate and lived. And they were dirty, they were exhausted, They were depleted, but like countless other young men, they were in this shadow of the machine that drove the 19th century industrialization in London. And at first glance, these 12 young men that were praying were just like everyone else in the factory they like looked the same. They were like a little skinnier because everyone was hungry. They were dirty, smelly, whatever. But there was something different about these 12 men who
who prayed together in room 14. This is what was recorded about these 12 men. They were radiant with joy and enthusiasm, period. How about that? That was their mark. Because their hearts inflamed with delight in the Lord, they radiated in their workplaces with joy and enthusiasm for the Lord. Or we said a couple weeks ago, a godly zeal. They wanted him. They just wanted him, right? Like prayer is not something that you go into in order to get something out of. It's not this like equative situation. The end result is delight in the Lord. You get him when you pray. You experience something different than just like chatting with a few friends about like the latest game or the latest news or whatever. But when people come together, your hearts begin to change when you pray. I don't know exactly how that works. We've said that before in this church. I've said it before from this pulpit. I don't know how prayer works all the time, but I know it works. Like I know that God loves it when his children pray. And I know that when his children pray, his will is, ta- is it, it takes root and it works. It's worked out because his people pray. He loves it. George Williams, a farmer kid, turned to a factory worker, prayed. He just gathered his friends, set aside time, sacrificed sleep, and prayed. Do you guys remember, uh, before the shutdown, do you remember studying the book of Second Chronicles together? We, we called the series Sustained Revival. It was, uh, it was messages from biblical characters from those books where God in certain times and in certain seasons begins uh, revivals. And if we are going to sustain a revival, we've got to be discipling. So it was a message on revival and discipleship. It was like six or seven weeks. And, um, and we learned a lot from that time, but we especially learned that whether it was a biblical revival in the Old Testament, New Testament, or if it was an extra biblical revival in this century or that, whatever, that throughout all the revivals in all of history, they always started with? That's right. They always started with prayer. It wasn't equative, but that was the common theme. That was the common theme, that God always moves when his people are praying. When they're not, he doesn't move. He uses prayer. And that's how George, his life was marked. Is that true of yours? His outward life. Last point, number four. So what did they pray about in room 14? Okay? His prayerful life. What was the content of their prayers? Hopefully this will encourage and sharpen, spur you on in your prayer life, okay? And here's the answer. For people, they prayed for their factory workers by name. They prayed for Mr. Hitchcock and Mr. Rogers who were um, over them in the company. They prayed for fellow friends in the factory and they used their free time to beseech God about the souls of the men that were like in front of them and that they were interacting with every day. It wasn't like a recitation or just like this dead religion. They had a a, a deep longing for the lost to come to know him because they, what they experienced, they wanted to share. It's the natural result of loving God. It always jumps its bank to love people. You can't say, I love God and I hate people. 
You can't do it. And when they started praying, the other men in the factory started to notice. The word got out that these like 12 kooks, they're like this little religious bunch or whatever, were praying together in room 14. And people started coming. The door was being knocked on constantly. And that little room 14 was packed. They encouraged each other uh, after long, hard days in the, in the factory to pray together. Bible studies happened, deepening of the word, sharpening of their understanding of the love of God and the gracious God that they have occurred. And, and, they, and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and their group grew and grew and grew. This was written by a man named um, uh, Hitchcock and Rogers. Um, an earlier uh, biography said, it was almost impossible for a young man in the house to be a Christian. But three years later, it was almost impossible to be anything else. So the company itself was transformed. Eventually all the employees, including Mr. Hitchcock and Rogers themselves, joined the weekly prayer meetings and Bible studies. And at that point, sensing that God was leading them, George and his friends, they said, maybe we should like choose a name for ourselves. And um, so they came up with a name for their movement and it was the Young Men's Christian Association. And they could never imagine how that group praying in room 14 would impact the rest of industrial London and eventually the world. In his journal, Edward Valentine summarized what happened in room 14, saying, Thursday, June 6th, 1844, met in George Williams' room for a purpose of forming a society, get this, the object of which is to influence religious young men to spread the Redeemer's kingdom amongst those by whom they're surrounded. The whole purpose of the YMCA is to influence others for the, the spread of the Redeemer's kingdom. I could get behind that. So all those young men, 150,000 people that had come to work in the darkness in London and, and during that industrial age, all cooped up and depressed. After these 12 were praying and after the group began to grow, George asked, God has so blessed us in this house. Why should he not give such a blessing in every house in London? You see how God's vision progresses he changes your heart and then he causes you to start loving others in front of you and then he moves to the nations. And in this case, George Williams was like, let's reach London for Christ. Are you kidding me? Why not? This is what he's doing. And so it turned outward. And although it might be unsatisfying because I know you're like itching for like the rest of the story of the YMCA and how he went about it business-wise and where he purchased and the finances and the people that gave and, and the strategy of it all, that's the genesis of the YMCA and that's the heartbeat of the man. Are you encouraged? Are you challenged by a life lived for Jesus? Man, I am. Let me read one last final quote. This is written by George and it's up on the screen for you. He says, I would therefore urge upon all young men to give themselves body, soul, and spirit to the Savior who loved them and died for them and to spend their lives seeking to extend his kingdom. Thus shall come to them satisfaction and peace in this world and eternal glory in the life to come. What a call to spend your life for the expansion of the kingdom of God. So we've examined his life, how he came to Christ, his surrendered life, 
his prayerful life, his outward life. Hey, which one of those did you need to hear today? Because his life still speaks. As you examined his life, I think it's appropriate as we head on into communion to allow the Holy Spirit to examine your own life. Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians, that prior to taking the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup, the body and the blood, to let yourself be examined, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, to raise to the surface anything that is not pleasing to the Lord. And if you want to live for Jesus Christ, if you want to have your life make a difference in the lives of others, if you want to give God all the glory in your life, you've got to submit yourself to yield yourself to him and say, it's all yours, Lord. Would you use my life and because you deserve the greater glory? Which one? So I think we should come to him and ask him, Jesus made this possible, this, this, even just praying to him and, and walking with him. He made it all possible through coming down to earth, taking on flesh, living a perfect life, dying on the cross for our sins, yielding himself to the Father's will to have his body broken and his blood shed. So as we remember him through the table, allow the spirit to work in your life. If you're not a believer, we'd invite you to, to come and, and talk to us about how to know the Lord. Grab someone after the service and say, how George Williams became a Christian, I've never, I've never heard it explained actually how to become a Christian. I thought it was just some like, go to church type stuff and follow some rules. I didn't know you could know God. We'd love to explain that to you. But we would ask in honor of God's word that you would not take the bread or the cup in honor of, uh, of what he has said. And also in the same vein, if you are withholding forgiveness from anyone, if you're not reconciled with someone, Christianity's hallmark is reconciliation and forgiveness. And so Jesus would say, I want you to come, but first go make it right with them. Go ask for forgiveness. And as, as far as it is up to you, be at peace with all men. Let's take the supper.